Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome to a very packed Briz Science for September 2017. Uh, this is Briz Science, the University of Queensland's free public lecture series on science, where we bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share their research and their passions with the audiences of Brisbane. Proudly supported by the University of Queensland and hosted here at The Edge, part of the State Library of Queensland, and I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. I'd also like to recognise those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future leaders and elders. So tonight, uh, we are talking about what is possibly simultaneously the most convenient and inconvenient substance on the planet, plastics. And we are very lucky to have with us tonight Dr. Bronwyn Laycock from the University of Queensland, who's going to be talking about the future of plastics and the roles of technology in our ongoing war on waste. And I will introduce Bronwyn properly in a moment, but uh, just to give you a quick rundown on the evening, if you haven't been here before, we're going to have Bronwyn do her presentation first. There'll be the opportunity for you to ask questions, and you can do that in two ways. You can either ask on Twitter, and you'll note Twitter only works when your phone is set to silent, so it's very important you do that now. Uh, and you can use the hashtag BrizScience, which you'll see up there in a moment, hashtag BrizScience to ask any questions, or you might have picked up a question slip on the way in and you can write your question down and then the BrizScience team will come and we'll collect and go through as many questions as we can. However, if we don't get to your question, never fear, there will be food and drink available outside, hopefully not served in plastics, or maybe hopefully, depends how you feel by the end of this. Um, to uh, have a chance to talk amongst yourselves and also with Bronwyn. Um, and I think that's everything. So, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to welcome Bronwyn tonight. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland School of Chemical Engineering and also at the Dow Centre for Sustainable Engineering Innovation. She has a pretty diverse background, having previously worked for the CSIRO, having multiple awards for innovation and research, and she holds 15 patents for everything from high temperature aircraft composites to bacterially derived biopolymers. So tonight to talk about plastics technology and the war of waste, could you please join me in welcoming Dr. Bronwyn Lakoff. Okay, thank you everyone and thank you very much for coming out on a Monday night. So. It's really great for me to be able to talk a little about, a bit about this topic because it's obviously very topical, but it's also extremely important. And I, I like to give you an opportunity to understand some of the background to plastics and also some of the strategies we're trying to implement. I want to make it really clear up front, though, I'm not offering any simple solutions here because I don't think there are any. I think that what we're going to be doing is, is raise some questions, talk about some of the potential ways that we can address some of the issues and also talk about what we're trying to do at UQ. So at the end, I'll talk about some of the um, projects and programs uh, we're putting in place to try and, and start at least addressing some of the issues that I'll be identifying. So I want to talk about me first, just to give you an idea why am I talking on this topic. So I started off actually as a synthetic organic chemist, and that's my little molecule up there, silocyclopentanes. And that was um, my PhD at UQ some time ago. <laughs> so naturally, you know, you have a very logical career path planned. So the obvious next step after you've done a synthetic organic chemistry PhD is you work in the pulp and paper industry. So um, I spent a few years working on alternative chlorine-free bleaching processes for pulp and paper and also some novel recovery systems for um, efficient use of reuse of um, byproducts. And then I moved on to something, again, completely logical, extended wear contact lenses. This is CSIRO's fourth top invention, and I was the polymer scientist who worked on this at, at, in um, CSIRO. I'm very proud of having worked in this field because these were demanding and challenging materials to synthesise. They are... Um, we, we used to have lenses that you had to take on in, put in and take out every day, now it's 30 days. Uh, 
very demanding material application space. And this highlights, again, polymers actually can do really clever things. We can design them to do really clever things. And they're ubiquitous because of that. I'll come back to that point later. Another logical step, high temperature aircraft composites for Boeing. These materials are really incredible because you can, you, to have lightweight aircraft that can fly at hypersonic speeds, you've got to have something that ro is robust to really high temperatures. And so this resin is one of the materials we developed. It's water-based, so we were moving away from organic um, solvents to make something that could be robust and give us a very efficient system. So that was a starting point. Since then, I took a little detour, did a Master's of Environment, did a grad dip in soil science, worked in um, consulting, I've worked in, I've been a research manager, I've worked in the CRC for polymers, where I was deputy program leader on polymer development. But for the last seven years, I've been working exclusively in biopolymers, polymers for sustainability, and I'll touch on that at the end of this talk. Now I'm going to just give you a little bit of a background into plastics, and some of you will know this well and some of you will, won't. What I really want to show you is that, that plastics are actually relatively new. So the first time you really had materials that were out there commercially was cellulose nitrate, which was made in naphtha. It's called Parkasine, 1862. This material actually was quite useful had a small defect. If anyone knows about cellulose nitrate, this is partially nitrated. If it's fully nitrated, it's gun, gun cellulose. It's explosive. And there used to be a problem when this was used, for instance, in um, billiard balls. Every now and again, they would explode. <laughs> so, so there were variations on it where the cellulose nitrate was made in camphor. Okay? And then there was the cellulose acetate. Now we're starting to get into more familiar territory. Okay? rayon fibres in 1899. These are still variations on derived from cellulose, derived from natural polymers. Galilith is an interesting one because casein comes from milk proteins. This is actually still made commercially in Italy. It, it, the problem is it can't be moulded, it can only be carved, but it's still a viable commercial product. But now we start getting into kind of things you would know very well, Bakelite. Bakelite is the first thermoset, so it's actually a um, material made by reaction of two different starting materials. Wood was actually one of the fillers that was in here, so this is an early polymer that had wood and chemicals that, and it was formable, which is why it became so popular and why you see it everywhere. PVC started arising in 1926, or around that time, then you had, we're starting to see the emergence of a, a, a large number of different types of polymers, um, thiourea formaldehyde, scotch tape, 1930, um, lucite, which is a poly um, acrylic, polymethyl methacrylate, um, plexiglass. That was actually driven by um, fashion. So those chairs actually started to, prom to drive the market for plastics. People liked the fact that it was new, it was, it was different, it was clear. Zarin wrap, okay, glad wrap, polyvinylidene dichloride. But it's here, here that we start to see the growth of real, uh, the real growth of plastics in, in our economy. Polyethylene in, in 1933, well, actually, it was an accidental discovery that there was this white product in the base of a reactor. And they spent the next five or so years trying to reproduce it and couldn't until they realised they needed oxygen in the system to actually make the polymer. So it was commercially, fully commercial in 1939. Teflon, 1938. Nylon, 1939. And you can see we're starting to move into everything that we're very familiar with. So there are now thousands of different types of polymers and plastics and new materials are being made every day. And the reason that they're so popular is because they're lightweight, they're cheap, you can make a very, very wide diversity of um, polymer properties from just the way you tailor and design these materials. 
And our modern culture, as you know, is heavily dependent on plastics. I just wanted to show you, this is the sort of reactor that was used for the early Bakelites. And this is the kind of chemistry. But this is the, this is the background to the talk today. Because they are such valuable kind of materials for various applications, the growth has been exponential and it continues to be exponential in the production of plastics. So as I said, back in 1950, that's really when it started kicking off. There was a slight hiccup during, during the global financial crisis, but really, there's no sign that this is slowing down anytime soon. And the main classes of plastics that we see being used in the market, these are the ones that are particularly important, the polyolefins, so polypropylene, polyethylene, low-density polyethylene, high-density polyethylene, polystyrene, PVC, a lot of these you'd be very familiar with, and you can see, oops, you can see that in all classes the growth is exponential. So really what we're seeing is this is a plastics era. We've got, if this is, um, you'll find that this just comes from a Caltech website. It's really trying to capture the fact that we've had a transition from the early natural polymers and ceramics and so on through to the alloys and metals and then back into these advanced materials with polymers, composites and ceramics where materials are starting to be tailored and designed and quite complex. Now many of you would know this but the issue is because there's such a massive production the systems at the present don't really cope very well. So we've got huge primary production, and this comes from a recent paper just a couple of months back, I think it's only just on pre-release. This is trying to capture all the plastics that are produced since 1950. And it's in millions of metric tonnes. So you've got your primary production here, there's a stream of recycling, but it's quite a small stream, at least to date. There's some incineration, but there's a large proportion that is basically ending up in landfill and discarded. There's also the material that's currently in use as um, in stock, in primary stock. I'd like to have a shout out to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and I don't know if anyone's aware of that foundation, but they are doing a lot of work in trying to develop strategies and policies that have, would have global relevance and, and um, framing transitions to the new plastics economy. This actually comes, oops, again. This comes from their um, publication, Plastics Economy, Rethinking the Future of Plastics. So at present, I've already shown you the fact that there's limited recycling. But the other issue is not only is there limited recycling, but currently there's a lot of leakage. And this is, this is the, the, probably one of the core issues. Not only is a lot going to landfill, but a lot's escaping and it's ending up in our soil, it's ending up in our marine environment, it's ending up where we don't want it to be. And the problem is if you're, um, if you're capturing most of it but you still have a continuous leakage, as we've got this exponential growth in production, so we're going to have a continuous feed into this leakage. This is from that Gaia paper again, so it's just modelling what would happen if we project the current trends out to 2050. And if we start looking at the recycling and we're assuming that we're getting better at recycling and a, bit, a higher proportion is recycled, and then there's also incineration, high temperature incineration. And this is the, to the all waste discarded, so into landfill and so on. Still, you've got a massive amount that you're trying to deal with. So I'm just going to touch on some, some 
there are many papers in this field, but I'm just going to touch on one which did a survey of plastics in the marine environment to give you a snapshot, a, a quick capture of what we're really talking about. So these people, this is one of the more thorough papers, and these are the areas where they did surveys and took samples across all these different locations. And what we're looking at is an estimate here. This is just count. So this is the different types of plastics. So we're looking at the, the smaller plastics. So we're talking not quite, well, microplastics and, and smaller plastic pieces. And up here is the large pieces, more than 200 millimetres. And uh, this is really pieces per square kilometre. Okay? So what we're not really, we're not talking about like a raft of plastic you can walk on, but we are talking about very significant counts and if you translate that into a mass, so this is um, global weight across the various regions, and you can see because these are the larger, heavier pieces, you've got particular areas where you've got a very large mass of um, grams per square kilometre. And you'll find that the scale is on this side, so 10,000 grams per square kilometre of plastics from the model. But at the same time, we know that there's leakage, but we also know that whenever we're making a decision around materials, we have to weigh up the cost-benefit. One of the challenges with the work that we do is that we have to try and be... Um, we have to t take a step back with our judgement and try and be rational about comparing the decisions on independent measures. So, for example, Many of you, I think, would probably have seen this, but this is the sort of comparison what with one use of a polyethylene plastic bag. You need eight uses of a reusable, non-woven polypropylene, for example, to balance out the fresh water production and the CO2 emissions for the production of the bag. Likewise, with paper, very large water consumption and CO2 equivalents. So... There's this cost-benefit analysis that always has to be done in making any decisions in this system. Um, we use life cycle assessment as the tool, and we try and be rigorous. But again, it's about the metrics that you're measuring it on. So, for example, some people would say, if you're exclusively talking about CO2 emissions, well, why don't you just bury polyethylene in the landfill, let it sit there, it's not going to degrade for centuries. So isn't that better than having something that burns and emits CO2? So the challenge is objectivity. Robust data collection and analysis. I have a paper up here, which was um, a paper that was recently withdrawn because there was a, a lack of um, robustness in the data and we have to be very cautious and rigorous in the way in which we collect data and analyse it so that we're actually making decisions that are better for the environment in the long run. So, again, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, this is their model for how they see that we can transition to a more sustainable plastics economy. Step one, we've got to have drivers that make it more sensible economically to reuse, recycle the plastic rather than just let it go to landfill or rather than just keep buying in virgin plastic. At the moment, it's actually more expensive in most situations to recycle than to buy in virgin. So that has to be radically re redesigned. Okay, so the second thing is, <laughs> I think it's really clear, we've got to drastically reduce leakage from our systems. We don't want plastics in the natural environment. We don't want negative externalities. We want to make sure that if we're going to be using these materials, that we're doing it in a way which is not harmful long term. The third thing is we want to decouple plastics from virgin, from fossil feedstocks, which I mean oil-derived plastics ultimately. Um, it's, it's the third step. The first, uh, first two are talking about transitioning our, our current systems and longer term, um, transitioning to re renewably sourced feedstocks. At the end of this talk, I'll talk about the work we're doing, where I'm, I'm mainly focusing in this area, but I'm also trying to think about some of these areas. So, 
the Ellen MacArthur Foundation proposes that 50% of the current effort should be on this recycling with radically improved economics and quality, making it a good business case to recycle, making it something that people want to do. Reusing, obviously, is also important. So 20% redesigning, rethinking packaging so that it's, it's actually reusable rather than single-use discard. And then there's fundamental redesign and innovation in plastics, which is my place. So we've got to think about things like, you've got your bicycles, they're made from carbon fibre composites. And that's cool because it's lightweight, it's high strength. But at the end of its life, can we recover that carbon fibre? Because it's high energy and expensive to make. So surely we should redesign the kind of matrix it's embedded in so we can easily recapture it rather than having it just have to be go to landfill. That's the sort of area where there's, there's right across the board a lot of thinking to be done. Or maybe there are some niche plastics that are really hard to put into our recycling system, so they might have a niche application. Can we redesign them using alternatives that are more readily slotted into our, our current our recycling systems or our reprocessing systems? I put this one up because really I think this is, this, this is trying to capture what we're trying to do. We've got to really carefully consider all the technologies that we're putting in place to make sure that as a system as a whole, if we make a change in one area, we're not increasing the environmental impact in another area, that as a whole, we've got the dematerialization, substitution, reuse, recycling, waste to energy and conversion technologies, and they've all got to be considered to be the most effective combination to give us the best outcome for the materials that we're using in this system because we want this to be sustained, and the growth is going to continue in these materials. Um, that's just uh, at the, at, in the current market conditions and without strong drivers in a different direction, these materials have to be managed. So now I'm taking a little step back and I'm talking about um, our particular research. So I'm in a, a, a group that was called the Centre for High Performance Polymers, and we do we're now the, um, moving into the Centre for Translational Polymer Research, and hi, Paul. <laughs> um, we do a lot of work across a wide range of polymer science, biopolymers, nanostructured polymers, high-value manufacturing, and so on. Do a lot of work with industry on transitioning to new materials. But, and this is examples of some of our current projects. So biopolymers from waste and methane, I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, carbon fibres from bio-derived sources, wood biopolymer composites, lignin-based polyurethane foams, starch-derived industrial products, films, packaging, and bio-based controlled release products. So that's, that's just a snapshot of some of the topical areas. But for us, the concept as a whole is taking on board some of the proposals from the um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation and from other groups globally, thinking about what we see as the ne next logical step we're trying to do, we're starting off here, we're trying to do a systems thinking approach. So we integrate um, life cycle assessment. We get some data about actual flows. We try and understand where are the thing, where are the key points where we could make a significant difference. And trying to do, as I said, in, a, in an objective fashion, which is incredibly difficult. Then we're also looking at materials design full life cycle, considering areas where we can make an impact by, for, for example, the carbon fibre um, story that I was talking about, where can we start to think about effective material design for full life cycle plastics? Um, then there's bioresources, waste recycling, bio-derived feed, feedstocks, biodegradable packaging, truly biodegradable materials. This is um, a lot of our current focus. And of course, coupled with that, we, we do have excellence in education because we are at um, university and we're trying to raise up the next generation of people who can take on some of these challenges. So just to take a step back and, and really talk about what we mean by biodegradable and bioderived. So there are really four quadrants and I just want to make it clear that 
you can often see people who talk about bio-derived polymers, but they could be sitting here. So there's actually quite a growing market in polyethylene, for example, that comes from sugarcane. So it's bio-derived, but it's non-biodegradable. It's exactly the same as polyethylene from ethylene. It's just made from a different source. And, and same with polypropylene, polychromide, and so on. We also have some materials over here that are come from fossil fuels, so those are the ones which you'd be most familiar with. These are the commodity plastics, so they're non-degradable and they're fossil fuel derived. We have a class here which is what we call the oxo-degradable, polyolefins. Those are the ones, um, you'll often see the oxo-degradable plastic bags. They're polyethylene that's had a metal stearate or similar added to promote oxidation because polyethylene is really robust unless you do something to perturb it. And they need UV, ultraviolet light, and oxygen to start to degrade. Then up the top, we have our truly bio-based and biodegradable materials, starches, cellulose, polylactic acid, PHA. Polylactic acid is compostable. It's not degradable readily in, in, in soil at, at ambient temperature. The others are truly biodegradable um, under most conditions. And PHA, which I'll talk about later, polyhydroxyalkanoate, is um, marine biodegradable because it's bacterially derived and anywhere there's bacteria, typically it will degrade. And up here we have our degradable but fossil fuel derived. So those are the four quadrants that you'll typically see. And I know sometimes there's confusion out there about which type of polymer we're talking about. Um, one of the things I just wanted to also mention is that um, bioplastics can also be recycled, so they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be excluded from the normal loop of recycling, which is often an issue that people talk about. So you can have energy recovery, you can have organic recycling by taking it back to CO2, or you can have mechanical recycling. I'm not saying bioplastics and biopolymers are the answer, they're not necessarily, but they have a niche. So in contaminated packaging, for example, they might have a niche in that space. Um, they're part, part of the overall solution. And this is the sort of tonnages. There are a tiny, tiny percentage of the material that's out there at the moment. So this is the biodegradable components in this quadrant. And this is the non-biodegradable, but this is the bio-derived. And that just gives you a snapshot. It's a tiny slice. OK. Um, this is an older slide. I probably won't talk to this much, but it was just trying to capture. Um, it actually comes from European Bioplastics, which is an interesting organization that, um, that focuses on bioplastics in the European context primarily. But there are industry drivers and there are external drivers, the external drivers being consumer acceptance. Um, it used to be that the price increase of fossil fuels was a problem, obviously not now, and that's one of the issues for the work I do. Um, for alternative materials to be competitive with um, polyethylene in particular, the price is ridiculously low. In Europe in particular, pressures from regulators are driving a lot of the market over there not so much globally. So you can have um, uh, fermentation chemical processes with fermentation to produce things like polyhydroxyalkanoates, or you can make them monomers, which you can then build our standard drop-in polymers from. Those are two of the strategies that you can adopt in, in making bio-derived polymers. This is a particular uh, product that was produced through the University of Queensland and um, Peter Halley, Professor Peter Halley, was driving this work with Plantic. Plantic was a spin-off company. It's now Curare in Japan. And it ha has a very global presence as a starch packaging. And this was one of the early spin-offs and a very successful one from some of the UQ um, Centre for High Performance Polymers. And it was sold as plastic trays, commercialised trays. 
starch derived. Um, and as I said, still commercially out there on the market, slightly modified from its original form. At the time that this work was done, the starch mulch films were also produced. So you probably are aware there's a huge amount of plastic used globally in plastic culture, so mulch films, and that's a contaminated mulch source. It's expensive to pick up and, and it's very hard to recycle or do anything with it. So it's a technical challenge, and, um, but it, it saves water, promotes crops, and a lot of our current crop growth would not happen without mulch films. So trying to get the balance right there as well is the sort of challenge that we've been dealing with. I wanted to talk briefly about um, my fields of research. So I work basically across, well, five areas now. The biopolymers, carbon fibres, composite materials, um, and controlled release applications plus waste conversions. And these are all different aspects of polymers, all of which could... Um, all of which slot into what I see as sustainability in the longer cycle. I've mentioned a few times I'm going to come to this. So this, this is polyhydroxyalkanoate. Those are what we call the granules. So this is a bacterium completely full of this polymer. You can get up to 90% by weight of a bacterium storing this polymer, which is a, a natural polyester, and most bacteria, or more than 300 species that we're aware of at least, can accumulate these naturally in the environment and also naturally degrade them. They're, they're, they're basically carbon and energy store for, for bacteria. They're a beautiful polymer because they're linear, high molecular weight, they can be made from waste, which is what we do. So we ferment carbon streams, waste streams, and feed the resulting acids to these bacteria and produce these sorts of polymers. So this is just a schematic of the full cycle. So enzymatic process in the cell polymerizes it up and makes semi-crystalline polymers. They're very similar in properties to polypropylene. They're more brittle, so there's work to be done in manipulating their properties. But they are melt processable. They drop into current systems, so you can just extrude them the way you normally would any plastic. And you can cast or you can make these sorts of containers. And there's a lot of work being done. So we do one type of work which is for fermented organic waste. That's an example of the biodegradation of these materials. They're, um, depending on their shape, they'll degrade in, in months to even sh a short time if they're thin films, but certainly six months or so and you'll see most of it disappear and it goes to CO2 and biomass another stream of work. So we've got a lot of activities. The problem with these is that they're more expensive, as I said, than polyethylene. So we're trying to not only work with waste, but also we've got a project where we're making them from methane. And commercially, there is actually uh, there are, there is a company overseas, a couple of companies that, that have done this on a commercial scale, making polyhydroxyalkanoates from methane. There's also work we're doing where we're looking at um, making them from CO2. So this is um, the greenhouse gas conversion to polymer in a full cycle application. Another area that we're working in, uh, I touched on before, is um, biocomposites. So we're looking at things like wood biopolymer composites so that at the end of their life, instead of ending up in landfill, which is what happens if you've got polyethylene composites, they can be recovered and in a circular economy provided you capture, if there's methane provided you capture the methane, then you can c consider this as a complete cycle product. Or if it's in an oxygen environment, it will go to CO2. So the concept is you have um, organic feedstock like waste products, biomass fermentation to produce the polymer, you have your wood flour, you make your composites, 
It's 100% biodegradable and then the CO2 goes into trees and you have a round cycle. Wood polymer composites is a, is a large and glowing, growing area. And one of the things we're looking at is because wood is biodegradable, it's available at low cost, and it has attractive mechanical properties. So then you can start slotting some of these bio-derived, more sustainable materials into what's existing markets. The last part of the talk I want to cover, <laughs> yeah, so one of the things I'm involved in at the moment is that there's a, a CRC, Cooperative Research Centre, bid that's going out. And this is on fighting food waste. So it's, it's a large... Um, it's being driven by the South Australian government. Uh, we've got something like $41 million committed to the first round from, from companies. Um, I, for those of you who are not familiar with it, these Cooperative Research Centres um, bring industry and academia together to solve Australia-wide large-scale problems. And obviously food waste is a very large-scale problem, so we've got an integrated strategy for dealing with it. And I slot into the Transforming Waste program within this bid. So looking at new co-products, functional ingredients, decision support tools. Coming back again to what I've been saying all along, Correct decision making is really hard. And so having tools where you can look at the potential impacts and also developing markets where you can have a product at one, at one point and, and someone who actually wants to use it at another so it's integrated. And technology optimization. So we've got a lot of tools already in the toolkit, but we've not necessarily got the right combinations of those. So if you're making an extractive from, say, for instance, an agricultural waste stream, Instead of just dumping what's left into the, um, into the tip, well, maybe you can ferment it to make energy. Maybe you can convert it to polymers. Maybe you can you know, do something clever with it, make a composite from it, anaerobic digestion, whatever. Making sure that the combinations maximise the value and also that we minimise what goes to waste at the end of any, any of these cycles. So that the rest of it, there's packaging innovation, preventing shelf, uh, preventing food waste, shelf life optimization. So, food waste is a massive problem environmentally. So I guess this is my last slide. I just wanted to say. So the take home for me is the solutions are going to be complex. They need to work together. So whatever we do, we want to make sure we've got a systems wide approach that gives us the, the, the best um, strategy for dealing with what is an issue that has to be resolved. And we want to make sure that whatever we do, it makes the best sense now that it can at the time, so that we're making logical steps that don't do more damage than the alternatives. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. So, um, give you a chance to catch your breath if you'd like a glass of water Thank you. to refresh. Um, so, we've now a chance to, a chance to ask any questions that you might have. So, if you've got questions, either you can start tweeting them or write them down and wave your question slip in the air, and uh, we will come round and collect those and get through as many of them as we can. Um, in the meantime, just announcing next month's presentation, which is Mother Nature Advancing Science. So this is a talk focused on how mathematics and physics is now harnessing the natural world and natural phenomena to increase our understanding of nat nature um, and to minimise the impact of large-scale technologies on our environment. So there is definitely a um, so some overlap, perhaps, between next month's talk and this one, but uh, quite different topics. So join us for that one. Um, check the website for all the details. All right, so we have some questions coming in off Twitter and otherwise. So the first question was around recycling. Um, what needs to be done to make recycling more efficient or used more widely? So there need to be really cost-effective screening processes to start with and also really um, 
systems-wide capture of the plastics. So one of the barriers at the moment is it's expensive to transport, it's expensive to screen and filter out. Um, there's a lot of clever work being done in putting dyes and labels and so on into, into some of the plastics so that they can be automatically screened using things like infrared to avoid any manual handling. So we just got to bring all the costs down at every stage of the recycling process. And maybe there'll be things we're not even thinking of yet, but there needs to be, there is already quite a lot of work going into this particular area because it's the obvious, you know, low hanging fruit, improve the recycling. Um, question, what's the difference between starch and cellulose in plastics? <laughs> Uh, it's the arrangement of, of the, the polysaccharides. It's just starch is a, a multi-layer system and Paul over there is the better place to be talking about this. Cellulose is um, just the, the, it's the arrangement of the um, ring cycles, the, the C6 and C5 units in, in, the, in the molecule. Great. Um, so question from online, a direct message. Um, how should we trade off the... Oops, sorry, I've lost my screen. Sorry, how should we trade off the benefits of plastics versus food waste versus yeah. anything else? That is the core question. It's yeah, so no pressure, 30 seconds, yeah. whatever you... <laughs> okay, it's, it's actually... This is, this is one of the difficult questions. So one of my students at the moment is just doing a, a, a study. We were looking at a comparison between polyethylene packaging and starch packaging for food packaging, comparing meat and cheese. It turns out that it's... The, the, the thing that just dominates everything else is how much of the food is lost, how much... Because the meat production is the killer in any life cycle assessment. So the only way we can trade off is to do a rigorous assessment of the relative costs and benefits. And if we're going to have extended food life through better packaging, you're probably going to have better environmental benefit than the cost of having the, um, the polyethylene that has to be recycled or whatever. On the other hand, if we can get really smart materials, so starch films are actually... They have really good barrier properties, really good oxygen barrier properties, so they actually give us real benefit. So if we can trade off some of the benefits and get advanced properties from some of these bio-derived materials, then you can have a bit of a win-win. You can have better um, food packaging performance, plus something that could be ultimately recyclable and go into the food system. Okay. Um, question from... Um, so, a question from Adrian. What will happen to the plastics in the oceans? Will it just stay there? Yeah, so one of the reasons why polyethylene has been regarded as such a great material is because it is really, really robust. It takes, it's, it's made from carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, which are really stable. So it takes a lot of work to break them down, but eventually they do. So um, it'll be tens, maybe hundreds of years, but in the presence of light and oxygen, ultimately they do break down. What we've got to do is try and avoid continuing to put much more in the system than the system can cope with. Um, it's so expensive to try and recapture and recover the plastics that are out there in the environment. I think realistically, unless someone comes up with something I'm not aware of, it's unlikely to happen. So time, with time, what's there will eventually degrade. But let's just stop putting so much more in. I've mm. um, got a question about... Uh, I've heard about microfibers, plastics from clothes, even yes. in drinking water. Um, do you know anything about...? I know they're there. It's not my personal area, but, yeah, look, plastics are everywhere. This is going to be the plastics era when people look at it geologically. They, you know, they're just... Uh, if, you, if you look at um, any time you wash your clothes, if they're, if they're plastics there, you know, your microfibers come out. We know they're in the wastewater treatment systems. We know that... Um, there's, there's plastic out there everywhere, and it's not my personal area of study, but the research is continuing globally. Um, slightly different question, uh, which was, you've worked on many different things. How did you choose what to work on next? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, totally logical framework, of course. Um, 
I'm trying to do work in areas that A, are interesting and B, I think will make a difference. So I'm, I'm quite selective, believe it or not, mm. particularly now. Um, first off, someone's got to fund it. So you, you, either you get some of the fundamental discovery grants, which some of my projects are, or industry pays for it where there's an industry, industry wants a solution to something. So you, you, you have an element of choice about some of the discretionary um, discovery grants and the rest of it you do something that you, fits with your values and direction, but um, fortunately industry wants to do as well. So an element of choice and an element of being driven by commercial needs. Right. Um, all right, I think we've got one more question and then we might uh, move out to food and stop interrogating you. Um, so it's pretty broad, but what are the respective roles for government, for science and for citizens in managing waste? Yeah. Okay, so government really has to do policy setting and, and, and you know, set some policies in place which helps with, with waste and also things like funding some of the programs, the bigger programs like... Um, you know, the CRC on food waste or, you know, other initiatives. As citizens, you have to put your dollar where you, <laughs> your beliefs are, but also, you know, ask and request for things to be done. So the Global Voice, um, if, if you think that plastics in the environment are an issue, well, you say so, I think. is, And, and also if you feel like um, some of the things like some of the initiatives that are being done around saving the use of plastics in our uh, overuse of packaging or in our single-use throwaway kind of culture, if we can start to send a message that this is maybe not the best use of this material, that would also be good. Um, what was the third group? Uh, citizens, government and science. So science, I guess kind of science, is, <laughs> science is what I've been addressing. Van Bronwyn's research. <laughs> yes. Um, well, look, thank you so much. I think that's a, it's a great moment and a great message to end on. I think it's been wonderful to see some of the complexities mm. around the war on waste and why it's perhaps not quite as simple as we might sometimes hope, and also to understand the role that technology might play in addressing these challenges in the future. So could you please join me in thanking our speaker tonight? And thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and definitely join us for Food Outside, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.